available on our um, ULVLC LibGuide, which I'm going to put in the chat right now. And when I have uh, finished this session, um, oh, thanks, Rachel. I discovered a new slide template. Um, uh, I don't even know. I guess a slide template repository from um, Lois, who taught me, because you know Lois' the slides are always on point. And I think it's called Slides Go or something like that. I'll send it to you. Um, I guess Rachel has indicated in the chat that she's already learning stuff and I haven't even gotten to the juicy stuff yet. So that's great. Um, so this will be available uh, on the uh, ULVLC LibGuide. I will also have these slides linked. So there are points um, in the slides where I have um, like citations mentioned and things like that. You will be able to get back to those later. I'll post those right after the session. Um, so that you can refer back to the slides um, if you need to get some of that information. And I do have a references list at the end, as well as a go link to a Zotero library that's open that deals with reflective practice in general that I am sort of frequently adding to. And yes, Michelle in the chat, Lois is amazing. So very excited. All right, so I am going to, uh, let's see. I don't I may have made made a mistake here in terms of my screen sharing stuff. So let, let's see. Um, I want to talk through your responses. So I'm going to ask y'all, can you see, are you still just seeing the slides or are you also seeing something in front of the slides? Something in front? Sweet. All right, there we go. Um, hopefully the something in front is the Mentimeter and not like, I mean, I don't have anything untoward up on my screen, but so, um, okay. So, <laughs> maybe Yoda, wonderful. Um, all right, so I'm going to hit present here and look at y'all's responses. So first thing I asked you is, um, how would you define reflective practice? And said, it's totally fine if you don't know. Um, I am actually excited that a bunch of people are, oh no, you can't see it now? Okay, hold on. Let me, let me work this out. I can do this. All right. It's back. You can see Mentimeter. Yes, great, thank you. Okay. Excellent. Um, so, okay, so here are your responses. Um, and if y'all have been to any of my sessions before, like in the past three years, uh, you may know how much I love Mentimeter. I use it a lot in classes and training sessions. Um, like some of you, I frequently get emails from Johnny from Mentimeter, who is, I guess, in charge over there. Um, and uh, I find this delightful, but I know some people don't like them. All right. So several people said, I don't know. I'm not really sure, but that's why I'm here. I love it. Um, Melody, I'm sad to hear that about Johnny. Uh, Johnny once sent me an email that told me I was in the top 2% or something ridiculous of Mentimeter users because I do really perhaps overuse it. Um, I see an I don't know. I see an active process of building in regular time for critical reflection and professional practice usually in writing, using probing questions on assumptions, impact improvement, and so on. Very good, very nice. Being mindful with action, question mark. I think that is a great way to describe it. Uh, maybe more being more intentional about how we do things, thinking about how we could do better, do not know. Would think it means to look at what you have said or done to this point and notice what went well and what needs to be changed. Mindfulness on a regular basis. I do, I want to draw this out because there have been two now that mention specifically mindfulness or being mindful. Um, I have seen an interest in reflective practice come up in librarianship literature over the past couple of years that definitely connects this with mindfulness. So I do think this is a practice that is um, connected with um, mindfulness as its own practice. Um, so I think that's an important thing to know about it. It's not something I talk a lot about during the 
actual session, but there is definitely a connection there. Commitment to self-learning, that's also really important. Um, looking back at something you've done or experienced and thinking about what you've learned from it. I don't know, double question mark. I love a double question mark. This is new to me. I don't know if this is the correct answer, but being mindful of your interaction, again, that mindfulness bit, excellent. And intentional thinking through of what went into your work. Don't know and unsure, awesome. Um, let's see if it will let me go to the next one. Okay, I asked, do you think you engage in reflective practice as a library worker? We've got five people who say yes, one person who says no, and nine people who say don't know. And that is also all great and fine. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of where you were before we uh, got started with this. So I'm gonna get out of here. And just again, just checking to make sure that now y'all can see my slides again. Wonderful, Patrick, Rachel, Brown, on it. Hello, slides. Y'all are the best, you really are. Okay, so um, I'm gonna jump in now. So this is Reflective Practice for Library Workers. Um, and before we actually get into the content, um, I did wanna take a moment and I wanna talk about uh, really where we are right now um, as a country and as a world um, and to just be, um, to just, you know, speak about the major um, issues of structural racism that we have in this country that we are right now in a major discussion about and that I hope that discussion continues. And one thing that I want to point out is that reflective practice has been used in other fields, not really in librarianship yet, although I see some opportunities there, but it has been used in other fields as a, a tool directly for addressing structural racism. Um, so I've got two examples here. Again, this is, these slides will be available later. Um, and I do recommend these two articles. They're very interesting and pretty different. There's one from teacher education um, as a field that talks about culturally relevant pedagogy and looking at critical reflection and how it can connect to uh, confronting maybe your own issues related to racism, racism that you've seen, racism that you've experienced, um, and to connect that to creating culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, and there's also an article from the Infant Mental Health Journal that looks at um, critical reflection as a way to dismantle structural racism within um, mental health consultation, particularly looking at um, uh, like new mothers, pregnant mothers. Um, so these are both really interesting. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about how this practice can help us as individuals and also potentially help us as institutions and as professions um, as we are looking at these kinds of major uh, issues. So gonna head on now and I wanna give you some background on what reflective practice is. So I'm starting here with the what, what are we dealing with? A lot of people trace reflective practice back to John Dewey, um, not, not our Melville Dewey. Luckily John Dewey I think was um, a little a little less controversial as a human being than our Melville Dewey was. Um, he wrote a book in 1910 called How We Think, and then he wrote a second edition in 1933 called How We Think, a restatement of the relation of reflective thinking to the educative process. And in that book, he defines reflective thought as being constituted by active, persistent, and careful consideration of any belief or supposed form of knowledge in light of the grounds that support it and the future conclusions to which it tends. So this isn't really about reflective practice, but reflective practice does draw from this idea of what reflective thought or reflective thinking are. And he also says in this book that reflective thinking is different from just regular thinking. It's different from just sort of mulling things over because it aims at a conclusion and it impels to inquiry. So reflective thinking is something that we would expect to help us to move forward, to help us to come to new conclusions and to be things that we could actually apply. So in 1983, a wonderful year, the year of my birth, and I believe also maybe Sean's birth. Um, so a great time was had by all. And also at that time, <sighs> Rachel, gross. Also at that time, Donald Shern, um, wrote this uh, book called The Reflective Practitioner, How Professionals Think in Action. 
and this has been a, a, a huge, this was a huge step in the field of reflective practice. So this is a book that almost anything you read about reflective practice will cite back to. And what Shearn wanted to do in this book was to advocate for a move from what he called technical rationality, um, which technical rationality is something that he says states that professional activity consists of instrumental problem solving made rigorous by the application of scientific theory and technique. Ultimately, what he's saying with technical rationality is that we would have approached professional learning and professional knowledge as just sort of a scientific application of something that someone else came up with. That there are these sort of accepted facts and processes by which we as professionals um, know and act and that those aren't, aren't really actually requiring a lot of thinking on our part. And he was advocating that professionals and people who are practitioners have um, need to surface knowledge and, the, and explain how and why they think the way they do to sort of uncover this tacit knowledge of the professions that is equivalent intellectually to this more sort of academic knowledge of like the scientific method and of empirical research. So what he says is that he wants to move from that technical rationality to reflection in action, which is a model that he refers to as an epistemology of practice. So knowing what you know that makes it possible for you to be a practitioner. And he writes, through reflection, the practitioner can surface and criticize the tacit understandings that have grown up around the repetitive experiences of a specialized practice and can make new sense of the situations of uncertainty or uniqueness, which he may allow himself to experience. I apologize for his super gendered language um, from 1983. He distinguishes between reflection in action and reflection on action. And this is a really important distinction for him. And he tends to focus a lot on this first one, reflection in action. Um, and he says that that's really all about the experience of surprise. So you're often reflecting in action when something doesn't go the way you would expect it to. So he talks about intuitive, spontaneous performance when that is when that intuitive spontaneous performance is sort of the way you always do things in your practice, um, when it just results in things happening as normal, you don't really think about it. Um, but when you have these kinds of spontaneous intuitive performances and something unusual, or unexpected happens, whether that's a, in a positive way or a negative way or somewhere in between, um, that's where um, you respond often by reflecting in action because you're trying to figure out what went differently. Reflection on action is different. It happens after the fact. So you're not really capturing exactly how you felt in the moment, but this is still really valuable. And it's actually something that a lot of reflective practice uh, literature since then has been based on this idea that you can certainly reflect on action as well as in action. So I want to talk a little bit about the why. There's a ton of research on this. A lot of it is more sort of case study based. There's not a lot of big quantitative or empirical studies about uh, why this works um, because it, it looks different for everyone. But I do want to talk a little bit in some broad strokes and then give you some library examples. So there is a really great column um, in American libraries in which Meredith Farkas talked about reflective practice. Um, and I think it was called something like to look forward, move, to move forward, look back. Again, it'll be in my bibliography list. Um, but one of the, she talks about two different things. She sort of points to scholarship that indicates that using these methods of reflective practice can help us be more culturally competent. It's something that we sort of saw earlier when I mentioned that article about culturally responsive pedagogy. It can also help us foster inclusive environments. And in that article, she links out to a really interesting um, example of a library director reflecting are using reflection as sort of a different mode of assessment for uh, creating inclusive environments. There's also lots of research in other professions. Reflective practice, I see it mostly in teaching and the health sciences. Um, there's a lot about reflective practice in nursing and medical journals, but also lots in teaching, whether it's at sort of the K-12 level or at, in higher education. 
but it's also used in other professions like social work and law, um, psychiatry, things like that. So people are, uh, these are practice-based professions that are uh, really looking at reflection as a way to continue to improve that practice. Um, and a lot of research in those areas, again, indicates that this can have a really positive impact on practitioners individually and also on their work um, and the impact that their work has. So I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the first study that I was able to locate in library and information studies or science that um, really deals with reflective practice from an empirical perspective, takes a, an actual sort of research study and that's Grinnell and Sin from 2014. Um, they surveyed library and information staff across the UK. These are UK-based librarians. And they asked their respondents lots of different things, but two major things that they asked them to consider were benefits and barriers of reflective practice. So the respondents indicated that benefits of reflective practice included things like learning from significant incidents. You also hear this in the literature called critical incidents, continuing professional development, identification of skills or knowledge gaps, and then identifying strengths and weaknesses like at the personal level. Barriers included things that we would probably all be able to have anticipated like lack of time, lack of motivation, lack of guidance or training. There's a very recent study from Miller in 2020 um, who replicated Grinnell and Sin's original 2014 study using the same survey with just some minor uh, changes and this one focused on health science librarians in the United States, so a different population um, but an interesting population because, again, as I mentioned, reflective practice is used pretty frequently in the health sciences fields. So it definitely makes a lot of sense for health sciences librarians to be aware of this and to um, talk about it. The benefits are similar to what we saw in Grinnell and Sin. Learning from significant incidents and identifying strengths and weaknesses are uh, up in the top again, as well as that identifying skills and knowledge gaps. Um, but the two that show up here that weren't really, that didn't rise to the top in Grinnell and Sin's study um, were achieving perspective and improving planning of future action. So those are some additional benefits that these librarians reported from their own work with reflective practice. Their top five barriers, again, very similar, lack of time, training, guidance, knowledge, and organizational support. So in order for a, for reflective practice to be something that you can actually work into your daily practice at work, there has to be institutional support or organizational support at some level um, to make it so that you have the time and the space to do these things. So right now I just want to take a quick pause and see if anyone has any questions. Um, so far we're going to go into um, the next bit here, which is about looking at actual cycles, and this is where I will um, start to ask you to bring in the um, sort of scenario or incident or however you want to think of it that you brought with you today. All right, seeing no questions, I'm going to move on to one of my personal favorites, which is Graham Gibbs' reflective cycle, and this is something that you see a lot in Reflection Literature. Um, it talks about Gibbs Cycle, which is from a 1988 book, Learning by Doing, A Guide to Teaching and Learning Methods. Again, you'll see this sort of theme that um, a lot of critical and critically reflective practice um, comes from the field of education. But this cycle can be applied to really anything. And that's one of the reasons I like it so much. So the cycle that Gibbs identified is sort of a cycle you can use for reflection that ultimately ends in action. So you start with a description, you go in and think more about the affective dimension, like your feelings, you evaluate, and then you analyze. And then from evaluation and analysis, you draw a conclusion, which helps you create an action plan. And I, again, these slides will be available, but I definitely, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, recommend the University of Edinburgh's Reflection Toolkit. There is a lot of great stuff there. Um, during an activity in a minute, I'll give you a short link to get to one of those pages so that you can kind of see how they describe this work. 
but I'm going to now give you an example from my own practice. So um, I, I'm going to give you this example. Uh, recently, I had a faculty member um, that I work with pretty frequently contact me for help identifying publication information for poems that were written and published by a pretty obscure poet um, in the mid 20th century. Um, and this is something that happened um, completely electronically. It was all email based and it was over the course of about five days. So that's my description. That's my first stage. Feelings, initially, I thought this would be great. I know how to do this. I've worked with this faculty member a lot. Uh, and I also have lots of experience locating these kinds of sort of unusual or obscure periodical publications through databases or through online resources. But then I began searching and it did not work the way that I expected it to. So I started hitting a lot of dead ends and I felt really frustrated. So I couldn't figure out why my usual strategies wouldn't work. So in my evaluation, that's when I really look at what went well and what didn't go well. So what went well was that eventually I found like a pretty strong lead for one of the publications um, that she was looking for, which was Red Earth Poetry Magazine. Though sometimes it's referred to as just Red Earth, sometimes Red Earth Poetry, sometimes Red Earth Magazine. It was a little bit difficult initially to kind of pin this down, but once I did, um, I found it and I knew that it was right because I knew that the person was publishing during this time frame and was looking at uh, other publications in Oklahoma. So what didn't go well though was that I couldn't find any digital options for this and so I had to refer my faculty member to other libraries or the Oklahoma Historical Society to actually try to ask someone who could pick up and hold the print versions specifically like what page numbers, what issue and volume numbers that she needed to request through interlibrary loan. So I wasn't able to find anything digitally and of course we're in a situation right now where lots and lots of libraries are still either closed or on very limited um, service options. So I felt like a little frustrated by this just in terms of the timing. And my analysis I found a WorldCat entry for Red Earth pretty early on, um, but I didn't actually share it with her because I thought, oh, I'll start from here and then I'll be able to find some options where I can really get her to the information that she needs. Um, ultimately, this turned out okay because when I shared that WorldCat link with her, she was really happy with it and was happy to take the lead and just kind of move ahead and contact who she needed to contact without me doing any additional stuff. But in the analysis stage, you also try to think about what you could have done better or what could have gone better. Um, this could have gone a lot better if I had just shared that with her from earlier on in the process, right when I initially found it. Um, and that would have saved me a lot of time because she might have said right at that point, oh, this is great. This is what I need. Thanks. Um, but instead, I spent hours and hours on ultimately fruitless searching for more of these poems. So the conclusion I drew from everything that I just said was that it would have been a more productive and in terms of the feelings part, a lot less frustrating experience if I had just shared from the beginning um, or shared earlier in the process what I was discovering. And based on that, my action plan is that next time I get a challenging research question from faculty member, student, anyone who's asking for research help, I'm going to immediately share the Google Doc. I usually do start a Google Doc um, anytime I am given sort of a tough research question to deal with because I like to track my process. Um, and I am sort of in my action plan trying to commit to sharing that doc immediately with the faculty member. That way, if I had done that, in this case, she might have said, oh, this is perfect. Um, and I would have saved myself a lot of time and um, anguish seems too strong, but there were moments of anguish. So now I want to talk through a simpler cycle. And this is the one that I'm going to ask you all to apply to your scenario. So be thinking about that as I am uh, giving you this description. And this cycle is referred to as what, so what, now what? And it is adapted from, Bar from Borton from 1970 in a book called Reach, Touch, and Teach. Um, and it has been iterated several different times. And so this is another pretty common cycle similar to the Gibbs cycle, but uh, it's just got three steps in it. Um, and I want to 
Um, actually, yeah, no, I'm just going to go ahead and go to the next slide because this is going to be your turn. I'm going to encourage you to go to that if you if you have the opportunity on a different um, browser or whatever to go to this link I have up at the top go.uncg.edu slash Borton that takes you to the University of Edinburgh's page that talks about this model the what so what and now what but Regardless, what I'm going to do right now is give you a few minutes, and this is all just quiet, personal, individual reflection, so this isn't anything, again, that you'll have to share, um, but I'm going to ask you to take that time and do a fairly quick what, so what, and now what with whatever um, incident or experience you brought into this session as a potential example. And if you didn't think of one, that's completely fine. Maybe you've thought of one since we started talking about this, um, or maybe this will just be a couple minutes that you can just like chill and think about whatever you need to think about. But I'm going to ask you if you did bring that to, you know, on a piece of paper or a Google Doc or on your notes on your phone or however is comfortable for you to consider some of the questions that I have on the screen or to feel free to go to that go.uncg.edu slash Borton and take a look um, at what's there. And I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to give you all a few minutes and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to choose a different um, scenario, but I am going to be going through this. What, so what, now what? All right, so I'm going to bring us back together. Um, as I said in the email that I sent out to all of y'all, um, you, if you want to share um, about your reflection that you do during this session, that's great, but no one has to share. I do just want to give an opportunity if anybody wants to share and kind of talk through their process. 
Um, I would be happy to give you the floor right now, but again, it is not at all required. All right, I'm not seeing any volunteers, so let me tell you what I reflected on. Um, oh, Rachel, Rachel, raise your hand. Yay. Good. Y'all are probably tired of hearing from me. Rachel. Yay. Yes. Um, so mine was to do a CST 105 this past semester um, with, you know, COVID-19 and everything going on. We had to kind of quickly make some adjustments to one of their major assignments and how they communicate with me about what they need students. So um, there were probably 30 sections of maybe 25 students per section. So we needed to quickly convey a lot of like things that normally happen in person. Normally students get the chance, um, I come to their classes or a librarian comes to their class to talk to them about the specific assignment and their research needs. But we had to kind of shift to an online format. Um, and so we had them submit uh, sort of questions through a Google form and made it into an FAQ page. Um, and it, so that was kind of the what, and that was, of course, sort of anxiety inducing. Um, and I think that a lot of their results showed that they're not really retaining long term what we're teaching them in initial library instruction, which is also very anxiety inducing kind of an imposter syndrome moment for me. Um, so the so what part of it is kind of like I needed to understand that, but also understand that maybe thinking about um, where students were in that particular moment, they're probably panicked too. They're probably, you know, information literacy is not what's at the forefront of their minds when they're trying to think about like their families and their personal situations. Um, so I had to kind of try and balance some of that initial panic of like, oh no, they didn't retain anything. They didn't, you know, I'm not making a difference for any of them with sort of this realization that, um, there are things pedagogically that I could do better, which is sort of the now what, but also like it's not 100% on me. Um, so I guess the now what part is thinking about how to improve some of the things that I'm doing, make it stick a little bit more for them, um, and maybe think about uh, doing some testing with different ideas that I have to see what kind of works best. So I don't know if that's a good example, but that's what I came up with. That's a great example. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, one of the things that I want to pull out from what you just said, Rachel, is that sometimes when we are doing reflection and maybe even sometimes often when we're doing reflection, um, we might uncover um, feelings or um, reactions that we're having that we're not super comfortable with or that we don't feel good about. Like you talked about imposter syndrome, you talked about sort of being disappoint disappointed with them. Um, I know you have a lot of feelings and I think that's great, but talking about talking through and thinking through those feelings, even though in the moment it can be kind of, again, kind of painful and kind of difficult. Um, I think that it, it does, when it's a situation that you can control, it is something that can help you move forward. Um, there are a lot of situations that we can't control. I still encourage people to try to sit with their feelings about those situations. Um, and try to process them as best they can um, within those structures. But I think when you do have a situation that you can uh, have an impact on personally, I think it, it particularly helps to try to think about and address those feelings. So it is, if anyone else wants to share, now that we have um, had Rachel break the ice, let me know. You can feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat or unmute yourself and just start talking. I, I'll just go through mine. Like I said, I did this. Um, what I realized was that since I had done an example already, I didn't actually come into this session with another example, but I thought of one pretty quickly, which to make this a bit meta, it was about this presentation itself. So. For me, the what was creating this presentation, it's something that um, I've spent a lot of time on over the past week or so, and it builds on things that I've done before and things that I have, have been thinking about a lot. 
but I really struggled with making this presentation. I, I, I had some kind of mental block about how to organize it um, and how to, how to effectively kind of express the kind of things I wanted to express and have the outcomes that I wanted. So I, I really struggled with the organization. I couldn't decide how to narrow the research down so that it was actually effective. And the, the so what of that for me was thinking that I really should a, approach a situation like this with an organization in mind, like a general organizational plan. Um, because when I initially approached it, I was like, all right, doing a presentation about reflective practice. Um, and that did not in any way help me um, like approach an organizational structure. Um, this would help with prep. I still don't really know why I had that mental block, like why it was so hard for me um, to think through how I wanted to organize this. Um, but in terms of the now what, I think if I were doing something similar in the future and I had that kind of experience, I would try to start with an outline and I would try to be more careful about um, organizing my like literature notes, my notes from the reading that I did. And I think that would have helped me, but personal organization is not a strength of mine. Um, and that is something that I am always trying to work on, but could always be working on more. And I think that actually would have helped me a lot. And I wouldn't have had that same block or that freeze when I tried to just take this huge amount of information and organize it in an effective way. So that's, that's how I, what I did for my what, so what, now what. Um, and these are just, again, two cycles that you can use. There's that Gibbs cycle, um, and there's the what, so what. Now what, I'm actually gonna jump to the reflection toolkit real quick here. So some of you may have gone here to take a look at what, so what, now what, but there are also other reflective cycles and frameworks that they offer here. Um, the Gibbs cycle that we talked about is here, but there's also this integrated reflective cycle that they discuss. Um, that's sort of somewhere in between the two. And these, for me, are all helpful cycles or, or cycles work for me in terms of thinking through a process. All right, so back to the slides here. Um, we've talked about these two cycles, um, and now I want to talk about two scholars, Larravee and Brookfield, who are both from the field of education. Um, and both talk about what they call critically reflective practice. So beyond just reflective practice going, adding sort of an element of critical reflection. So Larravee um, in an article from 2000, which actually reflects a book that she wrote in uh, 1999, but that we don't own, although we do have access to this article, um, says there are three essential practices for critical reflection. And the first one is time, making time for solitary reflection every day. Um, ideally, she says this would be a daily practice and it would be daily reflective journaling. Journaling is what a lot of practitioners uh, and people who are involved in this movement for reflective or critically reflective practice, a lot of them recommend daily reflective journaling. It does not mean that you have to um, you know, get a diary and start, uh, you know, a feelings journal for every day, but that might work for you. It depends on sort of what your process is like. Um, what some people do, and this is something I've done before, is like every time I teach a class um, is to jot down a few notes about it, um, like five minutes or less, but that's something that can help me kind of keep up with daily options for reflection. Um, because time, as we saw in some of the research earlier, is really one of the biggest barriers that people have. She also says that an essential practice is to become a perpetual problem solver. So a quote from there is, while they learn from the past, they thrive in the present. So this idea, again, of reflecting in action, reflecting on action, constantly learning from what you're doing, and taking that into your present moment and your present practice um, and still approaching what you're doing with a sort of problem solving mindset. And then finally, and this is really important, this is part of where it becomes critical, it's questioning the status quo. So examining assumptions um, at the broader level and, and conventional wisdom 
but also asking yourself, why do I do things this way? So something for me as a teacher is that I often um, start class pretty much the same way. Um, and that's something that I, if I were to sit and think and do some critical reflection on, I might decide that I wanted to shake things up a little bit. Um, but it's just sort of part of my process and it's sort of built in and it feels completely natural at this point, um, even though it is not, you know, this, it's not a, actually a natural process. Like I somehow came to it from many years of doing things a certain way. So this is a, a part where we have to ask why we're doing things a certain way, why processes are the way that they are, and also why our individual processes are the way that they are. Brookfield, um, this, is, this is really how I came to reflective practice, is through Brookfield. Um, so Brookfield wrote a book called um, Becoming a Critically Reflective Teacher. Um, and actually, Brookfield was on our campus a couple years ago through the UTLC. He came, he's UK based, and he came here and did workshops about critical reflective um, practice and also some other um, different sort of educational topics. But he describes critically reflective practice as a process of inquiry involving practitioners in trying to discover and research the assumptions that frame how they work. So connecting back to Larravee, there's this uh, assumption questioning and then connecting even all the way back to Dewey from 1933, this idea of inquiry that reflection leads to inquiry of some kind. Um, his focus is again really on teachers, but I have found his uh, work to be applicable widely across the different. I mean, I do teach a lot, but there are also lots of other elements of my job that aren't teaching related that I have been able to apply um, Brookfield to. Um, so he talks about four lenses. His the first lens is our autobiography as a learner of practice. So being able to um, think through who we are, where we came from, what our personal experiences have brought, and he asks us to recall emotionally charged dimensions of our personal autobiographies because they can help us understand why we do things the way that we do them. And again, for a teaching example, um, he talks about how, you know, you as a teacher may do something that isn't really necessarily a best practice. It's just something that you do as part of your own practice. And it's usually because of some kind of learning experience you had um, in your personal autobiography. The second lens is looking at our learner's eyes. And again, this is a very teaching oriented language, um, but I think that we can uh, come up with other options here. For example, we might ask someone to observe us while we are working the desk or teaching a session or training students or many things that we might do. We could ask for someone to observe us and help us get a different perspective. The issue here when we ask for feedback is that um, we have to really uh, do the work that shows that we are open to feedback um, because power structures and power relations obviously exist in any kind of situation. In the situations that Brookfield is describing, it's that big power structure difference between teachers and students. But of course, there are many power structures involved in our library, in our university, in our profession. Um, that might um, make it harder for some voices to, or some people to feel that their voices um, are going to be heard in the way that they're meant, or that some people are going to um, react poorly and that there are going to be negative impacts um, because of this. So you have to show constantly, if you really want to open up to this, you have to show that you're always being critically reflective of your own practice to indicate that you're open to these kinds of things. But anonymity is important, um, particularly in the case of teachers and students. And he uses a specific uh, technique called the critical incident questionnaire, which can be done as kind of if y'all have taught or trained like a one minute paper at the end um, of a session or at the end of a week of class where you can kind of ask students to reflect on um, what went well and what didn't go well and what could have made things better for them. The third lens is our colleagues' experiences. Um, this is really important. He identifies this as something that can help us, uh, can help provide us emotional sustenance. Sometimes um, 
we might feel really alone in the way we're experiencing things and particularly right now when we're all working you know so many of us are working at a distance um being able to talk to colleagues and kind of reflect through things again kind of like with lens two with the learner's eyes it helps you get a different perspective on your actions and often it's surprising when you hear how your actions are being interpreted by other people once again trust is really important here um, and thinking about power dynamics is also really important finally the fourth lens for brookfield is the theoretical literature um, and he talks about theory giving us opportunity to name what we're doing. So we can name our practice by looking at, um, instead of considering what we have as just unique and idiosyncratic experiences, looking at how they contribute to uh, larger, uh, you know, theoretical perspectives or epistemological perspectives as we start to look at uh, what's being said about these kind of things in sort of a larger outside of our own individual context. So that's a lot of information. We've already done one sort of short reflection and I'm going to end this on what I hope is a very positive note um, because I have pulled um, two activities from Tony Gay's 2011 book Teaching and Learning Through Reflective Practice, A Practical Guide for Positive Action, which is a book that we have as an ebook, um, and then I do encourage it's it's very uh, practical and it has a lot of exercises included within it. But one of those things that's really important about um, Gay's work is that uh, he talks in chapter three of this book about how important framing is. And this chart that I've included here is an example. If we ask ourselves deficit based questions, what what was the problem? What did I do wrong? How can I fix it? we can really flip all of those so that they're more strengths-based. Um, so like what did go well about this? Because I think for, for many of us in libraries, we tend to focus on the negative things that have happened. Uh, a class that went poorly, a, um, you know, a patron interaction that didn't go well, a project that didn't get finished the way we wanted it to. But if we try to turn those things around and frame them more um, from a perspective of strengths, that can really help us have some different conversations that still help us get to results and to action. So I'm going to walk you all through uh, a strengths based reflection adapted from this book. Same deal. I'm going to ask you just on a piece of paper or uh, whatever. I'm going to ask you to respond to, to one or both of these questions. And I'm just going to give you a couple minutes because we're getting close to the end here. Um, so you can choose which one. Um, in this book, he actually says, what was your best day at work in the past three months? I imagine that most of us have not had a great day at work in the last three months. Um, so I have expanded this to a year. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to either reflect on that first one or that second one. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to give about two minutes here. So you may only be able to get started with this. Um, and I am going to go ahead and mute myself so you can do that work. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next thing again in the interest of time, um, but I do recommend take, taking a look at this book. I found it really useful and for myself as I've been reflecting and um, I will also again, as I've said, have these slides available so that you can look back at the sort of the way I adapted these questions. So finally, again, 
however you're writing things down, um, I want you to start considering these things. So try to identify a major strength of yours. Think about how you feel when you get to use this strength at work. Um, and then think about what needs to change, whether it's something that you can change or something more structural that needs to change that would enable you to use that strength. And when you're doing this kind of reflection, um, I would encourage you, especially for that question there at the end, to just like, you know, pie in the sky here. It's, we don't need to think first about what's actually possible. So like, you know, if what needs to change for you to be able to do that in the workplace is for you to suddenly have a different job, you can write that down. Um, that might help you kind of think through your own personal plans, but then you can kind of bring it back down. Okay, so barring being able to just change my own job, what could I do in the structure that I have now? And again, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes with this and then I'll wrap it up. Okay, I know that was not a lot of time, um, but I do encourage you to do this kind of activity in Gay's book. There are actually a whole bunch more prompts and um, statements and questions about strengths um, that are, um, I think, really helpful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move to this slide. I'm going to also, as I'm thinking about it, put the assessment form link in there. Assessment is another thing that you can use as a springboard to reflection. So when you all give me your uh, different sort of uh, feedback on this session, I'd be able to use that and reflect on my own experience along with that. So this is kind of my learner's eyes, if you uh, fill out that form, which I would really appreciate. Um, and then I can start to use that and build into my own personal reflection. Um, the other thing that I haven't talked too much about today is thinking about Brookfield's, uh, that colleagues lens. Reflection can happen. Um, I focus today really on things that you would that would be individual or solitary reflection, but reflection also can happen and can be really amazing in groups. Um, and any of you who've heard uh, the presentation that Amy and I do about critical friends, that's another form of reflection that you're doing with a critical friend. Um, so there are lots of different ways. I'm always happy to talk more about this with people. It's a major area of interest of mine, um, but because we have five minutes left, I do want to um, open it up for questions if people have any. And I'm also gonna jump to my next slide here so that you can see very tiny print, the things that I directly cited in this presentation, but that go link that's at the bottom there, uh, go.uncg.edu slash ULVLCRP. If I go there, that is an open Zotero library um, that again, currently just has um, 19 items in it, um, but that I am frequently adding to. And if you have something that you want to add to this, please feel free to send it to me because I would be happy to include it. All right, uh, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, or put in chat, however you want to do it. We still have a couple minutes here.
All right, I'm getting a thank you from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I think y'all all know how to find me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.